Richmond was a basket case when Brendan Gale started as a player in the late 1980s. The situation was much the same when he became the club's chief executive in 2009. Yet on Sunday, the Tigers completed their most successful home and away season since 1995, finishing third with 15 wins and a record membership. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Mike. Is it all down to you? I know, no, I'm only joking. <laughs> I know it's a team thing, but you're the day-to-day -day boss at Punt Road. You must take a large amount of pride out of those stats. Oh, certainly, certainly pride. Um, you know, we've got a remarkable team of people down there that work with a really high degree of conviction. They're really invested in the journey and, and we've been committed to building a really strong organisation and, uh, and a strong business and, and a strong footy team. So, yeah, we, we're proud. But you have come a long way in a hurry, haven't you? At the end of this time last season, there was a lot of conjecture about the future of Damien Hardwick as coach and the club was sort of seen to be where Richmond perennial is. Yes, I mean, if, if, you, if you look in isolation at that point in time, yes, you could be forgiven for thinking that, but if you look at the previous few years and the body of work Damien had undertaken, we'd become a pretty good footy team. Um, we'd won the fourth most games in the competition from 13 to 15, and the more we looked into last year, the more we felt that um, yeah, we can turn things around pretty quickly once they're addressed. And, and I think we felt pretty strong going into this year, um, but you know, I wouldn't have hand on heart, wouldn't have expected to finish third. Was Damien's position ever at risk 12 ne months ago? Never. No. No. N-O. No move in any section of the board or the administration to no. replace him? No. OK. Let me give you three names. Neil Baum, um, Blake Carousella and Justin Lepich. Yep. All bring different qualities to yep. the table, but they yep. have been significant, have they not? Absolutely. And that's the other thing. Um, it's convenient for the media to, you know, they, they, want, they want to find a reason for, for success or for failure. Yeah, of course, it's yeah, easy. Yeah. But you know as well as I do, there's no one person, there's no one reason. And everyone contributes and there's just lots and lots of little things. And, you know, a guy like Barmy comes in and the one thing I've learned over the last few years is in, in managing high performance, there is no substitute for experience. Mm -hmm. Because that gives you wisdom and that gives you judgement. And Barmy just can sit back and has the ability to make everyone feel confident mm. about themselves and take the pressure out of things and, and much better for decision making. He's measured, isn't he, Barmy? Very measured. Yeah. You know, and, and just compliments our group beautifully. Blake, our, our offensive ball movement's a lot better. Leper is one on one relationships, you know, really strong. Great counterbalance for the coach. Um, I could go on. I mean, I could go on. And, you know, our, our captain, I reckon, has been really strong this year. Really strong. Take us back to 2009. Late 2009, you take over as CEO at Richmond. What was the state of the place then? Uh, look, it wasn't, it wasn't in great shape. Um, the board had committed to a, a significant amount of change. Um, I guess I was part of that. Uh, I think um, Terry Wallace had just finished up as senior coach. My predecessor... Or been, been finished up. It, we'd been finished up. Yep, um, yep. My predecessor had just uh, finished, Stephen Wright, who'd done a, a really strong job stabilising the finances and, and um, signing off on all the new development. So, um, but look, the, the team wasn't performing well on field. We had a new coach come in and Damien. We had to significantly transform the list and we had to really you know, build up our business. And at a time when we were just starting to see the beginnings of an arms race... And we're trying to do all of that when they're introducing two new teams. So, um, you know, the, drafts, the drafting around that time was pretty tough as well. Well, from the business perspective, what was your debt, what was your membership and what were you turning over? Uh, well, we, we would have been turning over probably about 28, 27, 28 million back then. Um, we had membership of about 35,000 members. And uh, debt, we're a pussy's bow. We're about five million in debt, almost probably in breach of our debt covenant. So, um, no, it wasn't a great situation. So fast track to now, your turnover is? Oh, we'll probably turn over close to 60 million this year. Yeah. Um, Membership uh, was 70... 73,515. Yeah. So it's more than double. And uh, and we pay down all our debt. So you, you're you're debt free. Debt free. Yeah. Um, what do you think you'll? Uh, how will you finish this year? Uh, I think we'll get our noses in front, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. 
I think, well, it's a very, it's a very competitive business. End of the day, we, we're um, we're not here to make big surpluses. We're a not-for-profit business, and and whatever we make, um, we invest back in our football program, and we invest back in our business. And um, finances at Richmond can be very volatile because the, uh, the crowds can be up or down, memberships, etc. So um, we'll be okay. There's a rare level of one stability and two optimism at Punt Road. You've had a connection with the place for 30 years. Has it ever been more stable than it is now? Um, look, there is a really good, strong feel about it. I mean, there's, there, you know, as I said right at the start, I'm, I'm blessed to, to, to be working with some really talented people and, you know, the, the huge integrity um, and values. And, and so, and they've been, my executive example, have been together for a while now over the journey and they're, they're, they're knocking out of the park. So I think that, that gives us confidence. Um, you know, I think our senior coach, I think he's been a really strong coach for us. I think he's even stronger having experienced last year. I think that the style of football they're playing is a lot more sustainable um, and stands up over the journey. You know, and 23 weeks, here we are, you know, third on the ladder. So um, and we, I think we've got a really strong, um, you know, talented board and I think we've got an outstanding president. And, uh, Are you talking about Peggy O'Neill, the first female president of an AFL club? Yep. What, what, makes her, um, what makes her stand out? I think she's got a really strong sense of who she is as a person. She's, she's not a populist, she's not a reactionary, she doesn't seek validation from other people. She knows what she is and, and I think she's uh, very strong and very experienced in, in operating and, and governing organisations. And I think she's very selfless. Um, and it's all about you know, running a board to create the platform for us in management and, and coaching to, to do our thing. People are liking what they see from Richmond, aren't they? I mean, you, you are the most watched team of the competition in the Home and Away series. Yeah, look, I, look, I have to rely on other people's views or what you know, I think about it, but, but certainly those indicators would suggest you know, we're pretty popular. I yeah. mean, we're really well supportive of the attendances. Number one at home, number one home and away, a membership strong. This is off the back of a pretty tough fixture, Mike. I think the AFL pulled the baseball bat out last year <laughs> and uh, um, we didn't get too many of those prime slots. But notwithstanding, I think we've been you know, very, very well supported. Do you think that's deliberate? Do you think the AFL would look at that and say, we will handpick Richmond's schedule and make it tough? Oh, no doubt. I know they do. Why? <laughs> Why would they oh, well, do that? Well, no, because to be fair to the AFL, I mean, it's an entertainment business and they want to maximise attendances and ratings and and they probably felt at the back of last year they weren't too enthusiastic about our prospects for 17. Um, similarly, there were some other clubs who probably had been deprived of some of those prime slots who were given opportunities and that's how it works. And so I'm probably a bit tongue-in-cheek, but... Mm. but yeah, you know, I thought it was a little short-sighted because in the previous few years, I mean, we've really delivered on ratings and attendances when some of the other big clubs in Melbourne probably struggled. I asked you recently whether you had any interest in Simon Lethleen's old job at the AFL, which is effectively the head of football. You said no because you would miss the buzz of club involvement. Yet, not so long ago... Uh, well, were you in, in for the MCC job that Stuart Fox won? No. You weren't? No. So if we go back further, you were interested in the AFL CEO's job when Gillan McLaughlin got it, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what about the club involvement factor there? Um, look, it was a big decision and look, I always felt that was Gil's job. Mm. Um, you know, I think, you know, a really strong job for the AFL. Um, I was strongly encouraged, strongly encouraged to sort of put my hand up by a couple of commissioners at the time. Um, and I discussed it with the president at the time, and it was a bit like playing footy. Sometimes you see ball, you got to get try and get ball. And so I thought it'd be, I thought it'd be an interesting experience to go through the process. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's a different job, obviously. It's a but but football clubs they're uh, they're in intoxicating environments, you know, and and they, and they just keep you highly highly motivated and. Um, and uh, you know you're, you're acting for people, hundreds of thousands of people who really, really care, <laughs> mm. really care, and that sort of keeps. And you've got that emotional involvement too, haven't you? It's your old footy club. 
Well, yes, it is. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professional sport administrator. I think that's what I am. I, I like sport. I like the colour, the movement. I love the passion. But I love the business that sits behind that. But at the end of the day, it's my old club. Your history with Richmond goes back 30 years when you were drafted from the Burnie Hawks. You came over to a club huge in name but in terrible shape at the time. I mean, was that at the, the tin rattling time, the Save Our I laugh, time? Mike. <laughs> I laugh when I look back. And I mean, I, how naive was I? I felt I was walking to, a, to an AFL club. But looking back now, and I, I laugh with KB, sometimes I have KB you know, at the footy as a guest, and we laugh about how impoverished mm. we were and some of the things were happening behind the scenes, which I had no idea about as a player, but it was a third world footy club, I look back now. <laughs> um, and so I look back, you know, I guess the coaches, KB, the players, um, I probably never had a chance. You know? mm. And so, but, but in all seriousness, that period I reckon has really informed and influence the way I try and lead and manage um, because I never want to sort of, you know, put our club in that situation again. So they had a budget. I mean, the Bernie Hawks budget might have been in better shape than Richmond's at that time. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, look, I didn't know much about the history of the club, but, you know, it was the late 80s. They were coming off of like a, you know, sort of a suburban war with Collingwood and, um, you know, the draft had just came in, the salary cap. The club didn't have money to invest in talent and recruiting and, and um, you know, I think KB told me a story once he had to sort of pay for and put up his own speedballs, which was probably mm. quite a remarkable achievement coming out of KB's pocket. But <laughs> that is a good <laughs> achievement. It's remarkable. <laughs> did you, do you remember back to that time, did you think there was a chance that your footy club could go under? I did, Mike. Um, I remember we were, we were, it was an AGM and Neville Crowe got up and spoke and the club, you know, was about $1.8 million in debt and, you know, I was pretty young and stupid back then, but that did seem like an awful amount of money to be in debt. Um, and we were dispatched, we were dispatched, we were rattling cans, we were, we were begging for money, we were sent out to regional Victoria and, you know, sections of Richmond. Um, and there was a big rally at the MCG, I remember, you know, thousands turned up. So, so I guess, um, I guess I were concerned. Mm. Um, would it ever really have happened? Probably not. Mm. And you know, I think Neville Crowe did a remarkable job mobilising and making the most of that situation and saving the club. Um, but as I said before, I mean, you can't win premierships if you're insolvent. No. no. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a really strong place to start. Brendan, you played 244 games in 12 years. I've always been mystified as to why you downplay that. As if it's sort of no no achievement at all. Um, because I was lucky enough to play with it against many many good players, Mike. And and you know I we don't have, have too many of the team sort of um, achievements, which some of my contemporaries have premierships and the like. And you know I don't have BNFs and all Australians and all those sorts of things. So um, that's you know why. you know only fourteen blokes in Richmond's history have played more games. Did you know that? Um, no, I didn't, no. But <laughs> some of those played many, many, many more games. That's true, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're a very, very proud Tasmanian. I am. And you've always flown the flag for Tassie. You played State of Origin for Tassie. Is it, where does that sit amongst the highlights of your playing career? Oh, it's one of my fond memories, Mike, to be honest. Um, look, we've played in a couple of finals campaigns and you know, winning finals uh, is nothing better, particularly against big teams at the MCG. But Looking back now, it was my first year. I played about six games. I was young and skinny and raw. Robbie Shaw was the coach. He, uh, he picked me. He gave the opportunity to play with my brother for the first ever time. It was the first time I played for Tasmania. I never played Teal Cup. We played in North Hobart against Victoria. Guys, had, you know, there was Scotty Clayton and Dougie Barwick and a few of the guys, the eldest, you know, Steve McPherson. And, and, um, and before the game, they paraded some of the members of the last team to beat Ta uh, Victoria, uh, the Tasmanian team, and my father played in that. So he was there and Stuart Spencer and to name a few. And I look back now, the wow, what a special, and we built the Vicks. And uh, it was a great memory. It was one of those things, probably the time you took for granted, but I look back now and think, wow, in North Hobart Oval, Mike, mm. you know, you ripped it up and down the wing at North Hobart. <laughs> but it was like a Coliseum that day. It was yes. just a wonderful atmosphere. You mentioned your father, your father Don. He was all Australian playing yep. for Wynyard. Did you have, fall out with your father over uh, your parents' divorce? 
Oh, we didn't fall out, but but Dad left home. Um, he had another relationship and he left home when I was probably about year seven, year eight. Um, and so, you know, we, you worship your parents and we worshipped our mum, uh, eight kids. And uh, so I probably wasn't that proud of Dad. That was a problem for a few years. And Were you estranged for a while? Oh, not estranged, but I just, you know, you'd, I didn't probably have that real relationship as father son, which you probably yearn for. Um, so probably looking back, I probably had some problems with that. But as you get older, you know, Dad was muddy, raised eight kids, got a great family, well educated, supported, fed, loved, all that sort of stuff. We looked at, and it's hard to do as a parent. Mm, and we become more aware of the frailties of absolutely, life, yeah. absolutely. So um, I was really looking forward to um, spending a lot more time with Dad once I did retire. But he got ill in my last year, and um, and you know, prostate cancer didn't do anything. Picked it up late. So I spent a month with Dad in palliative care and um, my brother and I and the kids, we just got around him and didn't, um, you know, you say all the things you want to say and all that sort of stuff and it was a really mm. rich time. I actually thought he was going to walk out of there. He built me a crosswords every day until yeah. his last day almost. Yeah. So, That's yeah. nice. So you feel you're yeah. on good terms yeah, with Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, And like you say, we've, we're all human and we've got mm. our faults and failings and shortcomings and he did a great job mm. in setting us up for life. Back to your footy, Brendan. The end of 2001. You played 22 games that year. Yeah. And that was your last year. Yep. My memory is that you expected to be playing in 2002. We'd agreed to terms to play in 2002, just simply on the same terms in 01, which wasn't much. And, and I think I was working well with Brad Ottens, who was really coming on, Otto, who's an Australian in 01. Mm. We'd obviously made the prelim. But I think the club was a bit stretched at the end of the year, trying to secure players and... and um, and, and keep the walls at bay. And, and they basically come to me and said, um, we want you to play, but it's going to have to be half as much. What was uh, as much? What was the as much? How much? Oh, how much? Yeah. Oh, well. Do you remember what you have been paid? Oh, gee, what, last year, I think 150, 180,000, I think mm, it was. So always. they so, wanted to cut that in half? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, Ruck, I was cooked, I was broken oh, yeah, and yeah. bruised and, and I had my professional life waiting. And I was probably Did you have your law degree by then? Oh yeah, 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 but I hadn't worked. And I was looking forward to getting stuck into that and uh, getting stuck into the law and, um, and I thought, you know what, it's probably the right decision and we'll go. So no hard feelings at all. No hard feelings. No, okay. not at all, mate. This is my memory of you. You were a hard worker, you were brave, yep. uh, you could be very good overhead but you could sometimes drop marks at... Most people would say, what's going on there? <laughs> Did, you had an eye problem, didn't you? Uh, I, a sight problem? Oh, I was pretty, uh, yeah, just pretty bad short-sighted and, and astigmatism one eye. So, yeah. look, I did used to struggle a bit at night. But my role was to create a contest, bring the ball to ground, you know, Naish, Daffy, tidy up, mm -hmm. goal, um, and contribute when I can. You had know, Richo running around creating havoc. So it was my role to create a contest, and it was pretty simple. And... Um, particularly during the northern years as well. So, um, yeah, they're enjoyable years. When we come back, Brendan, let's talk about your time as a rock star. This will shock you, Brendan. I'm going to ask you about one player. He wears number four and his name's Dustin Martin. Is it true that at the start of the year, the start of the year, Richmond's offer to Martin was 750 grand for two years? That's not true. Not true? No. Are you able to tell me what it was? No, I won't. But it was a strong offer, Mike. Um, that's better. That's, the numbers are better than that. It was a strong. It was a. It was a better offer than that. Uh, for a long, longer period. Uh, yes, it's my understanding. So that's wrong. I don't know. I saw that reported last week. Yeah. No, it was a very strong offer. It was an offer reflective of the fact that he just won a, a BNF, um, and he, you know he's obviously a very, very, very good player. So I think his manager at the time chose to sort of sit back and. And wait and see, and, and we perhaps not a bad thing as well. But um, he's obviously had a very, very good year, and he's sort of built on his previous year, and he's a very, very fine player for our football. Well, the club. prevailing view is that your offer sits now at 1.1 million a year for up to five years. Are we warm? Oh, there thereabouts. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, it's a strong offer. But the other thing, we'll, uh, our manager, sorry, Dustin's manager, communicated to us was that off the back of last year. You know, Dustin 
um, wanted to step back and see how the team performed this year. And it's interesting, um, you know, because I felt that I felt pretty strong about this year. I felt with all mm. the changes and you know the renewed focus, and well, clearly we've finished top third, and um, you know, so you'd think that'll be fairly persuasive as well. How frustrating is the waiting game? It's you'd rather it be resolved, mm. but it's just modern football, Mike, and. Um, you know, it's really important that Dustin makes a strong decision. We want him to make a strong decision. What's a strong decision? A strong decision is, you know, being confident that he's got a, a deal that's sort of market value and can be very strong for the club for the rest of his career. And sometimes that, that takes time to sort of look at opportunities. He's a free agent to exercise his rights, to have a look. That's modern football. Has it had an impact on our footy club? Not in the slightest. Has that no, no, had an impact on Dustin? No, I wouldn't no, have thought no. so. <laughs> um, so would we prefer it had been resolved? Absolutely would. But this is modern football. Uh, Dustin, as I understand it, is in New Zealand to see his father? Yes, he is. Yeah. Would you send anyone over there? Uh, no. Uh, I, I believe um, you know, he always told he's going at the end of the, end of the year and he's going with, uh, with Ralph Carr, his manager. Dustin's been to New Zealand frequently during the season, we've given the opportunity to go and see his dad in Auckland, so... Brendan, as the CEO, have you decided that you need to get in front of Dustin one-on-one -on -one and, and put the Richmond case? I know you've got people who do that, but to put your pers perspective on it? Yeah, look, it's, it's, a, it's a team game, you know, like in the day, Dan Richardson, not too many guys in the industry more experienced or, or more ethical or more knowledgeable of the market than Dan. So Dan's involved, you know, Barmy's been involved. They'll get involved from time to time and uh, make a contribution where I feel it's appropriate. When do you think we'll know? Uh, well, hopefully, um, you know, we're told at the end of the season. Is there a deadline? Um, not at this stage, no, no. <laughs> there was a story in the paper Monday that Richmond may be interested in Nick Revolt. Now, I must, when I read that, I just dismissed it. But uh, maybe there's some substance to it. Yeah, look, I, I believe it may have been true. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not intimately involved. It's your footy club. Yeah, I know, Mike, but I'm not intimately involved in those lists. So no one would have thoughts. come to you and said, Brendan, we uh, think we're going to approach no, Nick Reebok. No, I don't, think, I don't think they need to. Just, really? No, in terms of making inquiries and sounding people out. No, I, I just think... Clearly, we'd like to boost our key position stocks. They made a thought at the time that that you know St Kilda had made a made a made a decision on Nick, and there may be the fire still burning. Um, but look, I'm, I wouldn't have got anywhere. And I'm glad I didn't because you know, he's a champion of the game, and he's a he's a one club player, and he always will be. And, and what a remarkable send off he got at the MCG. You're in many many parts, aren't you? You're an ex player, you're an administrator, you're a lawyer. And you're a one-time rock star. <laughs> <laughs> you're the most unlikely rock star that I know, actually. <laughs> Didn't you play guitar in a band that... Uh, Very poorly. Pardon? Very poorly. No, but it's true, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. You, you were in a band called Trial by Video. Yes. You yes. played at the opening of the World Police Games? Yes, we did, at the MCG in about 93 or 94, in front of about 50,000 people. Was that more nerve-wracking than playing in front of about 80 because I had to sing a song. <laughs> what was we it? We also had a six-week residency at the tunnel for those... Uh, that go on a really? Sunday night. Yeah, so... I, I had glandular fever at the end of 92. And I was out of action, for like, real bad, for five months over pre-season. Missed the entire pre-season. Mm. I, I love my music. My mother's a music teacher. I thought, bugger this. I'm bored. I'm going to teach myself guitar. And I did. I got 10 chords, and then um, <laughs> what I discovered, you learn 10 chords, you can play most rock songs in the world. So anyway. What was the one you sang? Uh, it was a Paul Kelly song, To Adore, mm -hmm. I think it was. So, um, um, so yeah, Channel 9, I think it was the first year of the footy show, and they got an all-star band of sort of players who play instruments. and Tony Woods was one of them? Tony Woods. On the piano? Well, Woodsy was a classically trained p pianist, yeah. so he used to keep telling us, and... Woodsy used to want to put the keyboards up the front of the band instead of <laughs> the back because he yeah. thought it was all about it. Jimmy Mansell was a great guitarist. Paul Bullis was a great drummer. Mark Zanotti. Mark Zanotti was, um, 
well, you just built out so Alan Jakovic as well. And, wow. And I used to so sit, all in the same group? Yeah. So yeah. Channel 9 conceived us and they named us. They called us Trial by Video. Yeah. It's one of the lamest names. And, and so off the back of that, we got booked. There was a lot of interest. And they said, can you play here and play here? And we ended up in the MCG. So how long and did I'll you tell like? you, Mike, at that stage, only four bands had played on the MCG. And that was U2, Paul McCartney and Wings, Madonna and Trolled by Video. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact. I've always wanted to ask you about why your right eyebrow <laughs> sits, sits six inches above your left one. Well, I've got about 20 stitches and a big piece of bone in there. Missing, rather. And uh, Footy I, injury? Yeah, no, 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 I was playing... Uh, uh, I think it was augmented by foot injuries. I've got a couple of little cuts and nicks around there. But when I was about 14, I was bashing around on the school footy oval and a guy swung a golf club and just got me flush as I was picking up a tee. And it nearly could have taken my eye out. It just went straight over my cheekbone and up into here. Um, and uh, missed the grand final the next day because I looked like Elephant Man. My face was completely caved in. So... Um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Um, I cop a lot of, lot of grief over my eyebrows. <laughs> I get very self conscious about them. <laughs> Sorry, you just brought it up. Sorry. <laughs> there's a there's a blog site about my eyebrows. Is, is there really? What's people, it called? People, oh, I don't know. My kids found it. They hammer me about my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I raised it. It was the eyebrow, or why you're called Smacker. Do you know that? Yeah, no. It's my oldest nickname. It's my most enduring nickname, and no rhyme or reason. But when Wolsey started it. Uh, Richard was coach. He was confused. He called me Smackers and he called me Smackos. And <laughs> God bless him. Brendan, you've seen Richmond at its worst, and you're on the cusp now, of perhaps seeing them at their best. It's been an interesting journey, hasn't it, from sort of rattling tins when you started as a player to now watching your team go into the finals in a top four position. No, it's fantastic. We're very proud of the progress we've made, and um, you know you're alive here at Richmond, Mike. That's for sure. <laughs> Great to see you, and good luck for Thanks, September. Mate. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers, mate.